uh, some of the technical sides of things and um, some of the things that we need to bear in mind during the meeting. Um, uh, my name is Councillor Gavin Edwards and I'm the chair of the Housing Scrutiny Commission. Before we start the meeting, I have a few announcements uh, to make. This, this meeting is being streamed live on Southwark Council's YouTube channel. Please know all guests will have their microphones muted when they join the meeting. You will be asked to remain on mute unless you're invited to speak. Please wait until I have given you permission to speak before unmuting your microphone. To ensure that this virtual meeting runs smoothly, only one individual should speak at any one time. That, that is important because I've been in a few meetings where people have tried to kind of talk over each other and it just becomes in, in, impossible. Um, uh, so bearing in mind this meeting uh, will be streamed to the council's YouTube channel. If you uh, um, are planning to speak, you may choose to switch off your camera, but that's, that's something that's entirely up to you. Members of the public who are disconnected from the meeting due to technical difficulties should use the link or dial in instructions they were sent initially in order to return to the meeting. If a member of the committee or officer loses connection, can they please inform Fitzroy Williams or Everton Roberts uh, of this via email or Microsoft Teams immediately um, so that they can adjourn the meeting until the connection has been restored. Members of the public are welcome to record, screenshot or tweet the public proceedings of the meeting. A copy of the council's protocol for reporting and filming is available on Southwark's website. And finally, in the interest of health and safety, we'll be taking a five to 10 minute comfort break at the end of each hour. But that, that may not be necessary on for this particular meeting because we've, we've got basically got a two item uh, agenda. So moving on to some of the, the formalities of uh, the meeting. Um, I've not had any uh, apologies for absence. Um, Hamish has let me know that it's possible because of another meeting that he, he may need to leave a little bit early. Um, and we've, we've also heard from Bill, who's not feeling too well to, uh, today, but is, is joining us at the moment nonetheless. But um, we'll take it as read, Bill, that if you're struggling a bit, um, don't worry, you obviously can, can leave the meeting. Um, uh, so, uh, first of all, confirmation of voting members. Can voting members please indicate you are present when I call your name? Um, so, take it as read that I'm present. Um, Councillor Hamish McCullum. Uh, yes, present, Chair. Councillor Jack Buck. Okay, Jack's not with us just yet. I think he is planning to join us. Um, Councillor Dora Dixon File. Councillor John Hartley. Uh, Councillor Nick Johnson and Councillor Bill Williams. Present. Right. Um, just checking in with um, Everton, um, due to the fact that, obviously we've got, um, sorry, um, co-opted members, Chris Claridge. Present. And Ina Nagoita. Present. So we've got no problems with... Um, uh, being core at Everton, I'm assuming. No, I think you're on mute, Everton. Uh, I can see Jack has joined us now as well. I think that puts us uh, well over the line. Jack, we were just confirming the voting members. Thanks. Okay, great. So moving on, um, notification of uh, any items of business uh, which the chair deems urgent. So there are no additional items. Supplemental agenda number one contains the minutes and the report on the district heating and heat networks. Um, item three, disclosure of interest and dispensations. Does any member wish to declare an interest or dispensation in respect to any item on the agenda? Okay, seeing any shaking heads. Thank you for that. Uh, item four, can we approve as uh, correct records the minutes of the meetings held on the 24th of June and the 21st of July? Agreed. Agreed yeah. Thank you. And moving on to our, our first substantive item um, for this evening's meeting, which is the council's relationship with housing associations in the borough, the update from Wandle Housing. Uh, as you may recall, back in March, we heard from Wandle representatives and class and house residents as part of our exploration of the council's relationship with housing associations. And we asked that Wandle be invited back to this um, commission meeting to provide an update on the actions uh, taken. Maria Ramos and uh, uh, Ola Akin Tellur uh, 
uh, have agreed to attend this uh, evening to provide that update. We also have Clarkson House uh, residents, Emily Wilson and Ben Pigel uh, in attendance. Um, are there any of the ward councillors present as, as well? So just if you could indicate, I don't, perhaps not. Okay. So um, I'd like to, to come to the representatives from um, uh, Wandle Housing Association first. Could you, could you kind of identify yourself on the call, first of all? Hi, Maria. Yeah, I can see you. Could, you can take yourself off mute. Hi. Hi, Maria. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, appreciate that. And uh, I can see I can see Ola there as well. Hi, Ola. Um, I, I'll I, hopefully you you'll um, be familiar with uh, all of our proceedings at the last meeting and um, can provide us with an update now on some of the things that happened. We obviously understand that there's a lot of unexpected things that have happened in the wider world since then. Um, but it'd be great to get an update from you um, because there was, you know, the, the session we had back in March, um, feelings were running very high, understandably, because um, there were really serious issues that were taking place. Um, I think as representatives of your organisations, you, you kind of took that on the chin um, and, and said, yes, you know, you, you took responsibility for that. You apologised and made promises um, to carry out uh, a number of actions in order to reassure residents. So it'd be good to get your update on that now and I'll hand it over to whichever one of you wants to lead off. Hi so yes this is um, Maria Ramos I'm the uh, customer um, the head of customer services delivery for Wandle Housing um, and yet yeah, the last meeting um, we had the feeling was running quite high um, about the dissatisfaction from a number of residents. Um, the last five months since the last Housing Scrutiny Committee meeting it has been one of the most challenging times in recent decades for the housing sector. Um, and um, during the last five months, we have dedicated a high proportion of our resources to supporting residents in need to ensure that they receive the support and assistance required uh, during social isolation, which I'm sure you'll all understand. Um, in, in many cases, residents with high levels of support needs have required extensive arrangements such as welfare and safety, which has um, included putting in place uh, food delivery pa and care packages. Um, in addition to support residents, we've been finding other ways to ensure our blocks and estates continue to be maintained safely with limited resources, given the fact that the majority of our staff are home working and not visiting sites. So while this period has been highly challenging, there have been a number of opportunities for us to test our emergency systems, and we are now transitioning back into business as usual while observing social distancing. Um, while progress to improve communication and service delivery since the last scrutiny committee meeting has been slow, um, and those are the those, those those are one of the really strong messages we picked up from the last meeting was that communication was poor and service delivery was poor. Um, we have begun to make progress. Um, in um, in mid August, we issued our newly revamped monthly newsletter to residents, um, and it had a number of updates um, in terms of service delivery. Um, in addition, an estate, an estate inspection took place on the 21st of August, which highlighted a number of common themes. Now, we, haven't, we hadn't been able to do to undertake estate inspections with social isolation in place and with lockdown in place. So um, this is the start of um, monthly estate inspections, which will enable us to pick up on, on issues and um, repair issues and standards on the estate. Um, but common themes were picked up when we carried out the estate inspection, um, which were things like ceiling panels needed um, to be replaced, a number of lights being out of action, and common parts being in need of repairs and redecoration. There are a number of other issues that were picked up. Um, I've agreed um, with um, a group of residents at um, Class and House that the list of outstanding repairs will be shared with them so that they are able to um, monitor progress against those. Um, we did note, however, that the standard communal cleaning in the block was good, um, but repairs is clearly an area that needs some focus um, over the coming weeks and months. Um, something we're really pleased with is um, the uh, we ran our first um, class and house resident surgery um, on the 26th of August, and this was located at, class, at a class and house roof terrace. They've got a number of roof terraces on the estate, um, and we ran it on site. 
we saw a total of 17 residents on the day while maintaining social distancing. Um, and it was a really great opportunity to see, see, to see people firsthand, uh, firsthand, especially after the last five months of being unable to, to, to arrange kind of a residence meeting or, or see residents. Um, and a number, of, so a number of issues were raised and common themes were raised, such as repairs, um, energy charges was one that really surprised us. We, we weren't aware that there was an issue with the energy charges um, and, the, and social behaviour issues. Um, there were also a number of positive comments received. Um, uh, in particular, a number of residents said they were very happy with the cleaning service. They were very happy with the actual cleaner that they have on site. They found them to be very positive and helpful. Um, and there was also a desire from um, a few residents to have a resident association or some way of kind of communicating with us in a more formal manner, which I thought was very positive. Um, and uh, some discussion around uh, creating a gardening group to improve the green spaces on the estate and on the roof terraces. Um, so that was quite a positive start to improving communication. Um, the newsletter, uh, the inspection that we carried out and the surgery in August ha has given us a much better understanding of the issues and challenges ahead to improve service delivery at Clarkson. Um, but this is now where the hard work begins as we continue to ease out of lockdown and address the outstanding issues. Um, but the, we, we have given residents with an undertaking of um, publishing and communicating as much as we can in terms of what we're doing in order to reassure them that things are happening and when, when things can't happen or where there's delays that at the very least they have that level of communication and they understand where uh, we are in terms of issues moving forward um, so we're not as far forward as we'd like to be but hopefully people understand uh, the last five months have been incredibly challenge challenging we have made a very good start at trying to address the number of issues um, that are outstanding and um, we look forward to um, possibly returning again maybe in three months and uh, during a time over the next three months where we are able to get out there and um, make a, a, a lot more progress on issues um, and that's really the update that I have. Um, I don't know, I don't know, Ola, I don't know if you want to, to make any contributions um, I'm going to come to Emily and Ben in, in a moment um, the residents from from Clarkson House but I, before I come to them Ola would you like to say anything additional? Thanks, nothing to add from at this point. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, ben and Emily, um, thank you very much for taking the time to, to join us uh, this evening. Um, uh, you've heard what's been said um, already by the representatives from uh, Wandle. I, I think we can all assume that um, some of the kind of service delivery elements uh, that we discussed at our meeting in March would have been affected by the, the lockdown and the pandemic. Um, so, you, you know, uh, presumably you, that that will be taken into account in the things that you've said. But it'd be really great to get your thoughts, uh, because casting my mind back and looking at the minutes um, from the March meeting, one of the key elements was that one of the things that you were saying to us was that um, promises were kept being made, uh, but then things, nothing, they didn't kind of materialise. Um, it'd be really good to get your your views on on whether or not things have improved um, and whether or not you've got any kind of a, a additional points you want to raise on what you've heard already this evening. So I don't know which one of you would like to go first, but I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I'll jump in. Do you want to go first, Emily? Um, I, I'm happy to. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. Okay, um, so I suppose uh, I think I would probably sum up. We've seen some positive things coming out of Wandle. So I think what, what uh, for example, there was one newsletter, there was one resident surgery on positive developments. But as I think yeah, you kind Emily, of. Emily, Emily, oh, so, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm getting quite a, a, quite a long lag on, on the audio um, from your your contributions. I don't. It might not make a difference, but I wonder if maybe turning the video off might might help with um, with that. Sure, I turn video off. Um, so I would say we're we're probably in a phase here, like we've been through other cycles with with Wandle. We're seeing the gestures that are being made, but it's too early for us to actually see if this is going to make any difference. So I would say, for example, um, the 
there was a newsletter. I didn't really feel like I took any new information from that. Uh, there was a resident surgery. They weren't able to answer any of the questions that I brought. They said I'd have to, they'd have to follow up still waiting. Um, so I think we're kind of seeing the very beginnings of uh, some progress. I say we've seen this before from Wandle in previous cycles, so I think it's really far too early to tell where this is going to, to make a difference. I'd sort of pick up on some of the remarks Maria made there about where there was an issue with energy charges. Well, that's just proving the point that nothing, like the feedback we've given has been carried forward because that has definitely been raised before, um, so that really shouldn't have come as a surprise and that's kind of proving the point about lack of continuity um, and again th things like you know there having been some interest you know some what residents being interested in forming a residence association I think I first raised that go and went round that loop once before and again reached a dead end with Wandle and I I have no interest in forming a residence now because I've been through that and I can't can't be doing with that again um, so I guess uh, I'm seeing where this goes. I hope this leads to positive change, but I would say that it's too early to tell. I don't really feel like I was satisfied with the way that Wandle communicated with residents through the lockdown period. I would say there's kind of silence and, I mean, perhaps Wandle was concentrating its communications with people, but from my perspective, I didn't really get a lot of communication from Wandle during that period. Um, but I, I, you know, Ben might say otherwise, or other um, other residents may say otherwise. So I, th I think those are my main. But over to Ben to add anything further. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Emily. Um, so yeah, I completely recognise the situation that we're going through. So sympathetic to Wondle and how they're having to manage what's gone on over the last few months. Um, I'd echo what Emily said. I think it's far too early to see any change at the moment. The um, residents. Uh, surgery that was held recently and the newsletter and really came out in the last fortnight. Um, as Councillor Dixon Files said at the last meeting, as we've seen with Wanda before, whenever personnel change, it's all positive. There's a lot of good intent. Uh, but for me, it's really seen the follow up and the action. And as we've been in, in this lockdown period, certainly the serious items we were raising before around repairs and maintenance, we just went into a period of stasis around that. Um, as uh, Maria said, um, inspections on the estate only really took place uh, again last week. So long outstanding repairs haven't been completed and maintenance issues are built up over the last few months as well. So from my perspective, it's really seeing that one to have a comprehensive action plan for the estate as a whole, that we're aware of everything that they're intending to address and that following through on those at the moment, I have no evidence in, on most of those items. Um, so uh, yeah, for me, echoing Emily, um, need to see action. Um, and around uh, the communication over the last few months, the first we were aware of, of Wondell's approach uh, to stopping services um, and managing the COVID crisis was from Councillor Kerslake uh, messaging us as Wondell had messaged her to let us know that a statement had been put up on the website, but we didn't get any com uh, communication for weeks through any other channels as to what had been going on. So it didn't feel as though the communication had improved there either at that time. Thank you. I, I, I'm going to um, uh, open it up for any further comments or questions from members of the committee in a moment. But um, Maria and, and Ola, if, would you like to come back on any of those points that uh, Ben and Emily have raised? Uh, Maria, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I, I need to go back and find out why um, um, Emily and Ben are uh, suggesting that the communication was poor in the five months of um, the social restrictions or <clears throat> lockdown. Um, the, the, as an organisation, I know we wrote to residents and I, I can't remember the dates, but I'll, I'll pull those out and I'll send them. The, there was two letters that went out fairly early on. Uh, one went from our chief exec to all Wandle residents, explained the position and explained that it was going to um, stop uh, in, uh, repairs, we would only be carrying out emergency repairs and explaining um, various ways of communicating with us. Um, and it was a really, really, it was a comprehensive letter. Um, about four 
maybe four weeks after that, there was a second letter just adding to, in terms of the position, and that went from me, from me to all Wandle residents. Um, and again, confirming some of the arrangements and some of the changes that had taken place during kind of the, those initial months of lockdown. Um, so we did communicate with all of our residents. It wasn't, it wasn't for class and house in particular, but it was to all residents. And I, I am concerned if those letters weren't received and I will look into that. Um, in terms of the work that we've done, I absolutely appreciate Ben and Emily's comments about it, you know, it's too early mm -hmm. and I, you know, and there's absolutely no way that I, I thought we would come here and be able to demonstrate that we have um, made, um, you know, considerable improvement in the service or, or any improvement. However, we've made a start in what will be um, an improvement in service delivery. Um, but, but we absolutely appreciate that this is where the hard work begins. This is now, we, we understand what the issues are. We've started getting things in place in order to help us communicate with the residents better. And, and we now need to prove that we are improving the service and we need to make sure that we're communicating and getting those repair issues dealt with and those queries um, addressed. Um, and so absolutely, and I, and I welcome an invite back in three months when, you know, hopefully if things do, do not go back into um, lockdown situation, where we'll, we would have had, had made a substantial improvement and then we'll have Ben and Emily here able to confirm that. Okay. And um, Ola, did you want to say anything uh, more following uh, Maria? Actually, um, Maria said all the things I was going to say about writing to tenants and what we had. So the website was just follow on message. Uh, we did write it, but Maria said everything I wanted to say. So thank you. No, that's that's very good of you. Unlike um, councillors such as myself, Ola, you, you're being honest and saying it's already been said. Normally, we just repeat what the next person's uh, uh, said because we like the sound of our own voices a little bit too much. So, and um, thank you for that. Appreciate it. So, look, um, it, it, it sounds to me like um, it, some some green shoots of of um, improving um, communications, but but too early to tell is the kind of message I'm I'm picking up. Um, and you know. Uh, it sounds to me like a genuine commitment from from um, Maria and Ola in order to kind of deliver on the things that are now able a bit, bit more practically able to deliver in terms of um, repairs. Can I make a suggestion? Um, uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our municipal year as this um, committee. Um, what I'd like to say, I'm presuming that there's a, there's now a repairs and action plan um, becoming available following the surgeries and following uh, the inspections that you've done. Um, that that you you share that um that plan with um ward councillors obviously in the appropriate way with residents but also with the chair of the housing scrutiny commission for the coming year whoever that is um it may be myself it may be somebody else um and and, and that, that we have a little bit of correspondence uh, ongoing uh, on, on the delivery of that and that then at a later date we could you know whoever it is could then make a decision on whether or not it's necessary for us to have another session like this at the housing scrutiny commission i think this has been useful in terms of us you know a bit of holding to account frankly um, and making sure that that some of the promises are being delivered on it's a little bit early perhaps for us to to, to say for sure but i think if we went through that kind of you know a kind of on paper exercise and then we hear back from 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 emily and from ben and from the ward councillors about whether or not that stuff is being delivered on that's probably going to be a useful first step i'll ask emily and ben does it does that sound okay to you that sounds sensible to me yeah i just want to see the action plan and updates on those items being followed yes, through yes I'd, I'd agree as well be good and before before we finish the item, do any other members of the committee want to make any comments or have any questions on this particular item? I'm seeing shaking heads. Oh, uh, Chris, yes, go ahead. That's it. <laughs> I mean, I think I've got <laughs> an obvious comment to make, and it was something that Emily said about really giving up any uh, future plans to uh, form of tenants association on the estate if i could just urge the tenants to actually give that a second thought um i'm actually from uh, the tenants federation but i'm here on this committee from the tenants movement across um south the tenants what used to be the tenants council if we can give you any assistance at all um i know rhiannon is here um who is um a, a worker for the Southwark Group of Tenants Organisations. If you could leave her um, some sort of way that you could be contacted, 
we would really love to help you um, understand why it's really important for you to have to be speaking as one voice um, as an organization um, and you know if there's any way that we can help you to do that we would be we would be, be very keen to do it may i follow up on that yeah go ahead um so as residents we did push wanda before to let us set up a residence association and uh, we went through a long painful process with them where they claimed that their governance didn't recognize residence associations um, and effectively what we were going to be allowed to be formed would give us a means of communication to Wandle, but no commitment from them that they were going to act on anything that we raised or was going to support us in any way. So it felt like a fruitless exercise at the time and we went through a lot of pain. I understand things have potentially changed around that and Wandle's recognition now, um, but I think a lot of us who are involved in that process were pretty exhausted by it. Um, but we needed to know that the um, in terms of reference and the way we, in which the Resident Association would work with Wanda would actually be beneficial. Yeah. Well, okay. And, that, we... and I'm, I'm seeing a, a nodding uh, head from, from Maria there in terms of, you know, a, a commitment to um, perhaps making that a more substantive um, role for a potential new Tenants and Resident Association. I will leave it to yourselves in order to, to make a decision um, on, on whether or not to proceed with that and maybe restart that process. But, but thank you, Chris, for, for raising it. Um, uh, as we know from our, our position in, in the council, um, you know, uh, ten, TRAs uh, you know, do a, a great job in, in putting forward view, uh, the views from, from residents on our estates. Um, okay, unless there's any other contributions, Chris, one more, yeah, go ahead. It, it just seems to me, um, it's a question of your rights as human rights and that Wanda actually, you know, they need to find ways <laughs> that, they, that they can work with you. Um, and I just believe it's your right as a human being, you know, to, to have a say in in how you live. So if we, as I say, if we can help you at all, that's what we're here for. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. OK, I'm going to um, draw that to a close. Um, thank you, Maria and Ola and Ben and Emily for joining us this evening. Really appreciate your time. Um, and I hope this has had a positive impact on, um, you know, your communications and the way things turn out. We'll revisit it in the appropriate way um, uh, in the coming months as well uh, as a commission, um, not, not, perhaps not me individually, but let's see, and, um, uh, and, and then follow up on what we've agreed this evening. So thank you for that. So I'm going to move on um, to uh, the next item on our agenda, which is the um, report on on district heating um now i would sent this round to committee members on on sunday um appreciate it's not a huge amount of time in order to go through the report but um uh, hopefully people have had time to take a look um i um i think the the report and the recommendations that we've come out with hello dora well i can see dora's uh, joining at the moment um uh so um, hopefully people think that, you know, we've, we've got to a good place with the, the report and the draft. Hi, Dora, just welcoming you the, to the meeting. Um, and uh, so, uh, look, I, I'm going to assume people have read it. Um, the recommendations are what I'm going to focus on in just some opening comments around that. Um, you, you already know, because we've worked on this for a very long time, what our objectives were around kind of carbon reduction, improving communications and making sure we respond better to outages. Um, in terms of the evidence collection, I think we did a thorough job. Uh, you, you know, I think SGTO did a great job in getting us a lot of really useful information as well. Um, big thank you to Tom Vosper for the two sessions he did with, with us in public, but also the kind of technical um, information support he's been able to give me in the process of drafting um, this report as well. Um, I, I mean, the, the first recommendation is, is, is there, I've, I've sectioned it out into three different um, areas, starting off with strategic expansion and investment in the heat network, then on repairs and response to out, responses to outages, and then finally on the kind of metering and heat market regulation. Um, first one, is, is, is about inserting something new in our planning process to, to encourage more of those private developments that if they do come forward to, to um, link up with um, 
uh, the low carbon cell chip option. And that would make that the default option unless it's practically inf unfeasible. So sometimes it's just not going to be possible, um, but that would strengthen um, our hand in the planning process in order to encourage more private developments to be part of that low carbon option. Um, I've separated the ones out um, in on section um, recommendation two. Um, I, you know, I think that from a number of committee members, there was some some concern around um, the potential private sector partnering, given the experience the council has had um, over a number of years on big strategic partnerships with private sector organisations that, frankly, have have failed um, uh, both re residents of this borough and the council in order to deliver on the promises that were made. So uh, the, the two elements of that, firstly, We've now got, because of the earlier report that we did earlier this year, we've got a properly in-house repair service now with direct management control, a lot more control over that service than we previously had. And that there is a potential, it seems to me, for more cost saving and efficiency um, around district heating repairs by expanding the role of that particular service. And that that's something that should be looked at. So that's what the recommendation does. The second one is simply to, to, to urge extreme caution um, and to exhaust other possibilities before we enter into um, any uh, widespread strategic partnership with the private sector around um, district heating. Um, moving on to recommendation three. Um, we heard a, a number of times from leaseholders during this process um, about you know, very high charges that we're getting. We've got to recognise as a committee, as councillors, because it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of of the law that leaseholders need to make those contributions. Um, but other councils have found ways of smoothing out the, the, the contributions so over time. And one of the ways of doing that was through a, a sinking fund. They've done that in Brent, uh, building up a fund that can pay for some of those um, bigger investments and repairs that are, are needed. Now, I, I've, I, I've done this as a recommendation is something that should be investigated and looked at. I'm, I'm not saying anything more than that at this stage. What's right for Brent might not be right for, for Southwark in this particular situation. I know I'm gonna to come to you. Am I allowed to talk now? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Come to you. You put your hand up. So I thought I'll take yeah, them as people come. I I really appreciate. Um, it's about how it is formulated about leaseholders. I don't think that I have heard any leaseholders not wanted to pay for what is right. So when the reference is that actually the bills are too high, they are not high in the amount the the the, the way the leaseholders refer is the fact that sometimes they are not justified in the sense that they might have been done two or three years back and the, it's a repetitive job or it is not the right documentation or um, probably they should have been allocated differently. So it has to be a little bit more nuanced. It's not necessarily the amount in itself, but is the reasonability and the justification. Because yes, absolutely, in the law, the leaseholders have to pay. And also the law does say that they have to be justified and they have, they have to be um, uh, reasonable. So maybe we should put it in that way. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, 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 I think this recommendation goes, you, you know, if this was looked at seriously as, a, as an option, that might go some way to dealing with some of those issues around repetitive charges and things like that. Um, but it is something I think that needs to be looked at in detail and it hasn't thus far. far. And this is a little a little nudge from, from this commission in order to kind of say, look, this needs to be looked at more closely um, as, a, as a serious issue. Thank you. Um, I, I'm for, uh, recommendation four is a slightly more obvious recommendation about making sure that best practice is spread when, when we come out of this, um, uh, this, this government funded uh, investigation. Moving on to five, we're now in the section on repairs and response to outages. It, it was obvious for, particularly from the case studies, that um, text messaging was a good way of communicating with residents when outages happened. It was a good way of getting the message out quickly, but far too often people just weren't getting the information because they either didn't, hadn't registered their mobile phone um, with the council 
or if they had, then that number was out of date or wrong. And, um, you know, it's the council's responsibility to make sure that information is up to date as possible. So we've got a recommendation there about, particularly for those estates where we know there's that there are problems with outages, but they, they seem to happen year on year in certain places, that we do a concerted piece of work in order to get that, get residents uh, mobile phone um, uh, numbers, you know, we, we can incentivize that. I've put that in as, as, a, as a possible recommendation as well. And also we make it part of the script on repairs, you know, so when people ring up about repair, you know, ask the resident, can we register your mobile phone number as part of our records? And then that's more up to date and we've got, we've got better information. Uh, rec uh, part C on that, I, I do need to amend because I've said two related actions, actually should be three related actions. Um, COVID-19 pandemic means that the council now has much better information um, on which residents are vulnerable or sometimes need additional support. Um, and that information should be used more proactively during outages as well, because it's precisely those people who needed that, that additional support during the lockdown are the same people I suspect who would need additional support if there was um, hot water and heating outages on an estate. Um, six, pro um, I'll, I'll come to you on that, Jack, before I say anything more about that. Go ahead. Thanks, Gavin. Um, so I think all of these are, um, are really great suggestions. Um, I just had one to add, if that's possible, um, which is that I think the council should investigate the viability of doing social media notifications as well, um, because people change their mobile phones all the time, but almost everybody has Facebook. Um, and there are very simple tools for sponsored social media uh, posts to find people in specific areas. Um, and I think that's a, it's a really cheap way uh, to try and find more people who may have changed their mobile phone number um, but it but will see something if it pops up on their Facebook feed. Um, yeah. That's something we haven't really done as a council um, and I'd really like to see us do that. Um, mm -hmm. And just on, this is a slightly broader point, but just on the section around vulnerable residents, yeah. um, I am concerned, I have to say, that the council hasn't done a full and proper risk assessment of um, the risks vulnerable residents are being put under, particularly uh, in prolonged outages. Um, I have several constituents who have dealt with uh, prolonged outages who, for example, in that situation, you know, will be using the kettle to fill their bath and be having to go up and down the stairs from the kitchen to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, and I think not only do we not want a serious accident to occur during a, a hot water outage, I think the council also potentially are at some serious legal risks as well. Um, and if we are using kind of new information on potentially vulnerable residents, I think um, I, I would like to see the report put to point about a specific risk assessment for vulnerable residents during outages to make sure that we are protecting those people from any of those kinds of risks. Yeah, I think they're both uh, very sensible suggestions. So I should have said at the start, actually, um, obviously, this is a draft report. So what I will do is I will take your comments this evening. I will I will redraft and then uh, hopefully, you know, once I've, I've sent it around to you uh, in writing, same way we did with the repairs report and everybody's happy, we can then proceed to to sending the report over to the cabinet. So I'll make those additions, Jack, because they both seem like sensible uh, additions to me. Uh, and as I go through these, if, if anybody else has got any other suggestions, do just let me know. Uh, and, and then, you know, we can we can go on that that basis. Is everybody OK with that? Yeah, good. OK, Dora. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for lateness. I had um, a family emergency. No problem. Um, so I was at the hospital. Um, so, yes, great uh, draft report on the outages. And um, my estate is one of those that regularly, unfortunately, has outages. Um, I like the recommendation about the mobile phone. I like the one about Facebook from Jack. Uh, Council Buck. Um, maybe you could just tweak those points just to sort of say that um, we would like as a council to use contact details from residents, not just from housing, but lots of my residents don't always, you know, bring up the um, housing department, but they use the libraries, they use social services, they, 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 they complain about their bins not being emptied and whatever. Uh, there's, I'm sure there'll be a phrase of words that we can use to say that we will capture your contact details from 
general council services. I'm sure, I'm sure we can work that in. Yeah, that seems sensible to me. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris, you were indicating. I do apologise. I'm, I'm not right. very good, am I? Um, we, we can hear you now. We can hear you. <laughs> um, I've been asked um, to raise a point under the compensation process. Yes, go ahead. Um, that tenant and homeowner reps have been told since January 2019 that the policy was being updated. It still hasn't been. And people will continue to spend money on plug-in heaters or are freezing as they cannot afford additional costs. We've now been told that the council feel unable to address the issue as whilst council's future financial position is unclear. So we're asking that recommendation six should go further to securing an updated policy. I, I think that's, we, we, that's we're coming up to I this, think, aren't we? I think and, what I might do, Chris, is, is put in, an, is, is leave six as it is in that respect and then do an extra one saying, um, that this needs this is this is something that is becoming um, what is urgent now, and uh, you know, kind of firm recommendation to say this this review and changes to the compensation procedure in order to do this need to happen quickly now. Jack, yeah, sorry, uh, both the points that I wanted to make were on two uh, two points of the report. I don't have, so I'm not going to be speaking too much. But um, I did I did have a couple of points with the with the compensation. Um, and as Chris says, um, this is something which, you know, as a ward councillor for one of the, the worst affected estates, we've been told this has been under review for a very long time. Um, and some of the recommendations that we've been making as representations as ward councillors um, have potential to kind of smooth out some of these issues whilst the policy is under review. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things which we've been asking um, the housing department to do is to have a stash, uh, a cache, a, sorry, of um, prepaid electric card meters, um, because specifically, for example, on the Ellsbury estate, and I know that this is the case in, in other estates as well, mm -hmm. when there's a prolonged outage, residents are actually encouraged and often given electric heaters to use to keep warm when the hot water is not working, when the heating is not working. The issue with that is that many residents have to pay uh, their electricity costs up front on prepaid cards yes. um, and the costs for those heating um, for heating using those prepaid, prepaid cards is extortionate um, and many people simply cannot afford to use them. Mm. Um, so one of the things which um, if it's possible I'd like to add either to the compensation process or in a separate point um, is for the for the issue of residents who are using electric heaters uh, to keep themselves warm during outages, if that can be specifically looked at and whether there is a solution like having prepaid card, prepaid meters available at housing offices or in council buildings uh, to give to people during those during those periods. Um, I mean, I've, I've had constituents who during outages have been given a heater and they simply can't afford to use it and have been mm. sat in the cold for yeah. days and days at a time um you know and as a council who's responsible for this service it's just simply not it's simply not good enough um so that's one suggestion um sorry i don't have an eloquent set of words there um, no, no, that's fine that's fine I can, I, that sounds like a sensible one and i'm sure we can work it in in order to kind of cover Cover that. Okay. I can see what the issue is. So let's okay. let's go with that. Uh, and just one other um, one, and then I'll I'll be quiet for a while. Um, is that um, we know, and all of the research that we've done on this report has shown that there are some uh, district heating networks that have consistent problems. So for most people, district heating network outages are a one-off, maybe once a year, twice a year. Mm -hmm. But we do have estates like the Brandon and Aylesbury and others who have persistent outages that are reoccurring. And one of the issues with the compensation policy at the moment is it treats every outage as if it's a one-off, i.e. we have a formula for the amount of time that the heating network isn't working, where you are compensated for each hour that the network isn't working. 
Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't take into account is that some residents are having repeated outages and repeated outages and repeated outages. And the, compensa the compensation process doesn't recognize the accumulated impact on people's quality of life when they're losing days and weeks to the heating outages instead of just the odd three or four hour shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the compensation process review, I would like it uh, a recommendation be that the council consider almost like an accumulator policy so that if your district heating network has over and above a certain amount of hours down per quarter or per year you are automatically compensated extra for that quality of life impact not just for each individual hour does that does that make sense yeah i think i think um that's something we we could I think if we put it in as a recommendation for it something to be looked at I think that would be fine obviously it's a little bit difficult for us to to see what the financial implications would be and you know and how that that trades off against other considerations as well so I, I certainly think we could put that in as a recommendation for something that should be investigated uh, yeah. and looked at as part of this review um, which which obviously we, we're also encouraging to be um, finished as quickly as possible. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the, the next recommendation after the, the compensation one now, which is the uh, current uh, recommendation number seven, which is um, we, we heard several examples during the case studies of people saying that that you know they were offered to use the the shower and other facilities at local leisure centres when there were prolonged outages, but sometimes they got there and. Uh, the, the staff weren't aware of it and so wouldn't let them in so obviously this is about making sure that's joined up and that we are doing that. Um, also, this and this one came from SGTO, um, uh, Chris, on um, uh, noise pollution. Um, in in the update report we got, there was there was you know really quite horrible stories about people having to sleep in their cars at night time um, because of the noise pollution when it was on um, winter mode. Uh, and you, you know that that was something that was raised a couple of times and it's something that can have a really massive impact on people's lives and it, the council needs them to take it seriously so we put that in there as a, as a recommendation as well. Um, Chris were you indicating on that one? Chris and then Jack go, go ahead. Yeah just wanted to comment on number seven um, yeah. about tenants being allowed to use local facilities uh, you know mm. at this in this time um, if somebody on my estate needed to do that, they'd, it, it's a bus ride away mm. um, to, to actually use those facilities. It's it's really not a practical solution. No, I, I think with this one though, uh, Chris, you, you know, nobody's suggesting that that you know leisure centre facilities are any way adequate, adequate, you know, as a, as a stopgap. But if we have a prolonged outage in a place that is relatively near to a, uh, a leisure centre and that 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 can be made available to them I think it's a good thing that it is and if it is then people have to be let into the leisure centres when they they get there so um, you know this is something that is necessary for the council to do it but it's, it's not sufficient in any way so I'll you know I'll, perhaps I'll maybe slightly nuance the wording to make that that clearer. Um, Jack did you want to? Um... Thanks yeah just on um, the noise pollution could it also be added uh, for the Aylesbury estate as well? Because um, mm -hmm. we currently have a temporary boiler system in place on the estate where there are numerous boilers outside mm -hmm. that do make noise. Um, and I'm not sure whether that's whether that's ever been reviewed. Okay. Um, so if we could have that just added, that would be grand. Cool. All right. Fine. OK, moving on to the final section, which is on the, the kind of regulatory elements that we were warned about. Um, so if we have um, introduced across the board a decision uh, um, metering introduced across the board, that's going to be have a massive impact. And there are, the, we're going to have to have uh, a big decision on the type of tariff. Now this is we're kind of it, there's a lot of ifs here if it comes in. We, we're not sure that we're going to have to do this. But it did seem to me that it was important for us to kind of address this issue because we want to be able to uh, guide with a small p politically guide officers when they start if they do approach this issue. And it did seem to me, you know, we're trying to balance a few things off here if we if we have to bring in a tariff. We're trying to balance off 
um, that it's it's a fair charge that it's that, that those who are um, in financially difficult situations are not left exposed by a tariff but also obviously one of the reasons that we want that, that a tariff uh, would be introduced would be to encourage to change behavior around use of um, heat and having a more efficient use of heat and financially incentivizing that is a really difficult balance to, to have in that you'll see um, I forget which page it is in the report the kind of, there's quite a nice little diagram which kind of shows you the different trade-offs between different types of trap tariffs and it seemed to me that the one that really got to the heart of that that balance better than all the others um, was the kind of what they call the mobile phone tariff it called uh, Called that because it's quite similar to the way a lot of people have their their mobile phones uh, paid for you know you, you are actually given an allocation not given you pay for a set allocation over a set period um and and that, that kind of encourages you to use that heat in it in a way you know because it's not going to be a concern because you are paying for that already but then there's that kind of additional charge if you use over a certain amount now um, it's a very generalized recommendation at the moment. It's, you know, this is something that should be favored, but it is giving a bit of a steer that we do expect that that, that balance is reached when the cabinet comes to look at that issue. Um, but we also have a discretionary scheme. So this is the next recommendation. So that any new tariff should be introduced alongside a discretionary uh, aid scheme, including bill reductions for those with special requirements, such as those who require additional washing and bathing. So there, there are pe people, you know, who may have health conditions or other considerations, and they need to wash and bathe more than perhaps other people need to. And obviously that means they're gonna use more hot water. And it's not, it's not obviously not fair that those people would be left in a situation um, where they would have to kind of pay extra. So it's a kind of attempt to try and address that, that particular issue. Um, but a discretionary scheme could, you know, take into account a number of other elements as well, um, uh, particularly protecting people who are on the lowest incomes and people who are on fixed incomes. So that's that's a kind of element of it as well. And and finally, uh, recommendation eleven: um, if heat meters are required to be rolled out across existing properties, um, Housing Scrutiny Committee recommends that the accompanying program of education to help people understand how they work and how. Um, any associated charging would work. And that would include kind of digital um, tools as well, like YouTube videos to, to make sure that um, it's as accessible as possible. For Chris says it, I know not everybody is on the internet and not everybody has uh, access to um, those services. So it wouldn't be on only YouTube videos, but that that would be part of it as well. Um, so, um, I'm not, so I'm not seeing any other indications. Chris, go ahead. So um, I don't know if you're aware, but Dora did say that she's been trying to speak, but I'm not teaching you how to do your job. Sorry. No, Dora. <laughs> my, I can my see concern... you on my screen, Dora. So I'm, so apologies. I'm not. Sorry. I'm not very good at checking the chat function, Dora. I'm, no. I, I kind of look for people to put. It's. I've been calling the people who've been putting their hands up. So go, go ahead, Dora. And then can I come back, please? Yes, of course. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank, th thank you, Chair. Don't worry, we're all technically challenged. Don't worry. My hand is, is up, though. I'll take my hand down now. OK, right. Just um, to say, I totally agree with Jack um, Council Box uh, suggestion point six. Um, can I just also add that, again, because my ward is also very challenged by all these outages, that can we mention the fact that um, a lot of people in the tower blocks, um, mm -hmm. they have longer outages because by the time the heat gets to the first, second, third, fourth floor, by the time it gets to the 15th, 16th, 20th floor of these tower blocks, it takes even longer. And yeah. um, so that's just an issue that we can perhaps try and weave into the report. Okay. Seven, about the use of leisure centres. I'm glad we've put that in there because we want to give residents a choice. Um, mm -hmm. And if it's too far for them, fine, they can't use it. But if it's there, let's use it. Yeah. And can we also perhaps um, suggest in the report that um, that people who are on estates that have had outages can maybe have, I don't know, a pass, a card or something so they can use the leisure centres at any time of the day. People in my estates work shifts, two or three jobs on different shifts. So maybe a use of a card or a, you know, to get access to the leisure centres at any time of the day would be quite useful. Okay. Thank you. All right, they're, they're, they seem like sensible suggestions, Dora. Thank you for that. And Chris, I'll come back to you now. Thank you. Uh, it, it's um, 
going back to when you said about communication, um, mm -hmm. got, got big concerns about how this information is actually going to be relayed um, to residents. Uh, recently, we had a letter um, on our estate asking for views about um, district heating would people prefer it to be um, to, to mm -hmm. continue or um, for it to be isolated mm -hmm. um, lots of questions none of us knew this letter was coming I mean I, I would have thought the first step could have been to speak to the representatives from the tents association so mm -hmm. that we could be aware that this was going out um, people were not given any information in the way uh, that um, it was sort of suggested it was it was government changes but no great detail and, and people were asked mm -hmm. to, fill, to fill in a questionnaire um, so in our latest newsletter we sent an article around urging people um, to actually respond to the questionnaire but we know that people won't um, the biggest concern I have on this estate is because of the nature we're all houses uh, we have a, a large number of uh, right to buys mm -hmm. so the, the the needs of people who've taken up their right to buy may well be different to those of of tenants mm -hmm. and i know i know a lot of people who've taken up their right to buy have asked for individual heating mm -hmm. i just believe you know if we can have communication it's please can we have some training about how best you speak to people how you you actually involve people that have got experience in doing that as i say we we were left uh, just really not knowing what to do um, and hoping to get some more information that we can actually put out put out to the residents on our site. But I hope it won't be done in a clumsy fashion across the yeah. bar because it's really unhelpful. Okay, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, I, I'm gonna kind of, if it, has, has anybody got any other comments or additions they, they want to mention now um, uh, around this? I've, I've made a note of everything that's been suggested in terms of, of changes. Um, I'm not seeing anybody in, in, so, okay, Jack, go ahead. Sorry, Gavin, just, just as one final point on the, on the tariff um, section, and I, I appreciate that you said there are a lot of ifs. Could we maybe just add a final recommendation? Because I think the I, I I mean I'm not clear, and I don't know how how other members of the committee feel uh, whether they're clear about how any of these systems will actually work or be introduced. So could we add a recommendation that as soon as kind of a, like a strategic idea from from the officer team of of how we might go about introducing this, that it is brought back to the Housing Scrutiny Commission yeah. at the earliest possible date, um, so that we can start to scrutinize what it might look like. Um, just because, uh, like for example, in my ward, um, people don't get to choose how hot the water is in the pipes. It's an automatic system. So, you know, unless they're gonna completely change everything, you know, a tariff system wouldn't be possible. So, I mean, I would need I, I would need to be able to see how how it would be introduced before I could start to really get a grasp of what what is important for us to recommend. So if we could just add a final point that we would like plans for that to come back at this at the earliest possible date for scrutiny, um, I think that would just give me a bit of confidence going into the uh, into the year ahead. Good. Yeah, I think that's that's that sounds fine to me. Um, sensible suggestion. Okay. Um, any other contributions? Um, you can you can take it as read. I've made a note of all of the suggestions that have been made, and um, thanks everybody for your you, you know your contributions on on this. It's been um, it's been a good process, and I think we've got some good recommendations um, uh, from it. So so that's really good. A good piece of work. That's what scrutiny is all about. Brilliant. So um, moving on to the the last item in terms of the work program. Well, we, we're at the, at the end of our uh, our time as a, as a commission as it's currently constituted. Um, so uh, I think we've, we've, we can kind of genuinely say that we have got through a huge amount of work and got through, uh, you know, in a, any reasonable assessment, say we've got through the work that we uh, plan to at the start of the year. And um, yeah, so I don't, it's not really much more to say on the, on the work programme. Uh, and uh, obviously there'll be a new work programme for a new commission um, in, in the coming year. Um, I'm going to assume nobody's got anything else to say about that. Um, in which case, 
no tears now. Um, uh, that does bring us to uh, the end of our year. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So I, I, I just have a question. Will, yeah. will you be able to make recommendations to the newly formed committee? Because we've we've got a suggestion for a future scrutiny um, a committee to take on about new homes. And how, how can we get that across? Well, that, 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 to, that, that depends on, on who gets put forward for what positions right. in terms of chairing uh, committees. It, it, it is, is the possibility it could be myself, uh, Chris, or is the possibility it could be somebody else? And there's just no way of, of being able to, to say that at the moment. But no. there, there will be, in the same way, you know, that I hope you, you feel we, you know, this, this commission has been open about taking suggestions on items to be considered for scrutiny um, that then the, the one in the, in the next year uh, will be as well, whoever's chairing that, that commission. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's unusual for me to say, but, and Bill, will, Bill Williams will laugh, um, but I'd, I'd like to thank you for the way the scrutiny committee has, um, has worked this year. In my limited experience, it, it has been the best one um, that I've had the privilege to sit on. And I just unusually would like to really thank you for that. Thank, okay. thank you, Chris. That's I would pleasure. second that comment. <laughs> I think that's, that's, it's taken me 10 years to get that comment, Chris, but I finally got it. So th thank you. Uh, um, good. All right. Well, look, thank you, everybody. I know some of you got other meetings to go off to now, so I won't delay you any longer. Um, I'll, I'll see you all around very soon. Um, thank you, everybody. And um, uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Everton. Thanks, Fitz. Bye bye.